you, Jesus, and you're worthy. Psalm 86, church, starting in verse 8, says this, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. Can you believe that today, church? I'm so for God who does wonderful things. Sing his name today. He's the creator of all the universe.
ways, Lord, that are beyond our thoughts. Your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. You are God, enthroned in heaven. So we worship you today.
Happy New Year, church. Happy New Decade. Yeah, it's a new decade. Ten years from now, if the Lord doesn't return and you haven't left this earth to go meet Him, what's your life going to look like in ten years? If you're sitting in this room and you're a sophomore, junior in high school, and you're sitting in here and you're worried about Getting your driver's license. At the end of this decade, you might be a husband, wife with a baby in tow. Good chance of that happening. Some of you this, in this room, in the next decade, you're going to lead this life and go, we, go be with Jesus. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> but if you make it through this decade, you're going to be 10 years older. And at the beginning of a year, and I think it's even more appropriate, the beginning of a new decade, in these next 10 years, you're going to make decisions, and those decisions are going to define who you are and what your life is like. Last year, during this time of year, during 21 days of prayer and fasting, we talk about the cards in front of you. There's, there's these cards, and at the bottom, there's prayer requests. And we ask you the first couple weeks of the year to fill those out because we're going to gather and we're going to pray over those requests. And one of the men and one of the young women that got baptized today were on a prayer request last year. Yeah. That's what they were. That was their relationship to this church was a grandma and grandpa writing their names on a card saying they need Jesus. And in the course of a year, they made decisions to find Jesus, to... To, to follow him, and today you saw them get baptized. It was a world-changing year for them. And it can be a world-changing year and decade for all of us. My hope and prayer with this series is that the decisions that you make during these four weeks will change your decade for eternity's sake, that it will be not only the best year, but the best decade you've ever experienced because of the decisions that you make during these four weeks. And I already had the sermon prepared, and, and when we started, Cindy and I started our, our New Year's Bible reading, and hopefully that's one of your goals this year, to read the Bible through in a year. Um, we, we started over, and, and some verses just jumped out, and I had to add them to the sermon because they read right with what we were talking about. They're on the screen right now. First of all, it's the beginning of Psalms. As we talk about what we decide, the psalmist writes, oh, the joys. Who wants to have more joy this year? How about a more joyous decade? Well, the psalmist tells us how to get it. He said, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers and get all their life information from television. 
That's the new modern version. But instead, they delight in the law of God, what God says, and meditating on it day and night. And if we do that this year and this decade, we will become like trees planted along a riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Our leaves will never wither. I like this. Gilead, you will prosper in all that you do. Wouldn't you like this to be the year and the decade where you look back and say, I didn't waste any time this year. Everything I did prospered. It was all purposeful. It was all meaningful. And in the decade without regret, wouldn't that be great? The psalmist tells us it's possible. Because the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. The writer of Proverbs tells us the same thing. He identifies himself as Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. And he said he wrote these things. Their purpose is to teach people, us, wisdom and discipline, to help us understand the insights of the wise. I want to be wise this year. I don't want to walk away from any circumstance where I talk to somebody, encounter somebody, and say, man, I wish I'd have done that different. Boy, if I could have just had that moment back, what's going to help us to do that ahead of time? Wisdom, understanding the insights of the wise. It says their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, lives without regret, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs, I love this, will give insight to the simple. I'm just not that smart. That's okay. God's Word has you covered. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. There's a lot of C student Christians in the world. That doesn't mean you can't be wise at life. Come on. Can I get an amen? amen. Better amen than that. Amen. Okay. He will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Young people, you don't have to do what the world says. You can have wisdom and discernment beyond your years if you put God's Word in here. It says, let the wise listen. You say, well, I know a lot of things. Okay, they got you covered too. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. It'll teach you to stop telling people how wise you are. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the world, words of the wise. And that's, what, that's my prayer for you this year, church, is that you become wise to life. And that's why we're starting the year with a series called I Have Decided. I want to get right into it. Our key verse for today is, is found in the book of Philippians, and I find it interesting because Paul pins these words while he is in jail in Rome waiting for execution. And what does he write now? Some plans for the future. Now think about that. Think about how incongruent that is. He's in jail. The world would be like, man, you better be getting your affairs in order. He says, I am. I'm getting ready for God to use me more. Because he didn't let his circumstances define his mindset. He let God. So he was sitting there writing down goals and making plans. Philippians 3 tells us, brothers, Paul writes from a jail cell in Rome, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but I want you to say these next five words with me. But one thing I do. Say it again louder. But one thing I do. One thing. I forget what is behind. I forget my failures of 2019. I forget the, the things I did that I shouldn't have did. I forget, I forget about the things I should have did that I didn't do. And I put those things in the past. Why? They're in the past. Can I get an amen? Amen. You can't do anything about them. What you have is today. You can start fresh today. You, I, this is what I love about our God. He took all of man's sin, past, present, and future, and he paid for them on Calvary's cross. 
And so unlike, unlike the way the world looks, he's sitting underneath the rim, and you're taking a shot, and you miss sometimes. And he just shoot, he just pass the ball back and says, take another try. I love that about our God. He is the God of second chances. Every morning we wake up, David said, his mercies are new. We can start over. The past doesn't have to define us. So Paul said, I forget that. And I reach, I strain forward to what is head. And I pursue, that means he, he goes after it, he strains after it. As my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. There's some important life decisions that we're going to talk about in these, this series. But you won't take advantage of it if you don't believe that God is the God of second chances. So the first thing I implore everyone in this room to do is forget yesterday. Forget last year. Forget the last decade. Forget your failures. Forget it because it's not going to do you any good to dwell on it. But it, by forgetting them, it also means that you're not going to allow them to make you who you are anymore. Yeah. I still, after 33 years of preaching, have people run, oh, well, I knew Tommy Downs back when. And sometimes they have the courage to say that to my face. Well, I knew you when. You know, what that means is when I wasn't living right, when I wasn't pleasing God, when I was living like a fool. I said, yeah, you did know me then, but I buried that guy. He's dead. This is the new me, and I'm not going back. There's a song we used to sing. I have decided no turning back. I'm not going back because I've found a better life. So don't let the past define you. Press forward. And we're going to talk about four important decisions that I hope make up who you are this year and will define who you are going to be this next 10 years. Isaiah says the same thing. In Isaiah 43, he says, do not remember the past events. He said, don't keep looking back in 2019. Pay no attention to things of old. And then he says, look, I'm about to do something new. And then he says, even now, it is coming. Even now, it's right here. You say, where? It's right in this room. It's right here. It's a moment of opportunity for our lives to change, for us to actually experience a different way of living this year, a different result this year. Some of you are probably looking at 2019, you're like, glad it's gone. But if you don't want to just repeat, you have to change your decisions that you made in 2019. Can I get a better amen than that? We all know the saying, to do the same thing and expect different results is insanity. Then why do we keep living like we're insane? Doing the same thing, expecting different results. So he says, I want to do a new thing. What is it? You might not see it, but it's right here in this room. You have the opportunity for God to do a new thing right in your life. Today. Today. Right here. He says, do you not see it? Don't you see the opportunity? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand how bad it is. You don't understand. Well, he says, indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. That's impossible, rivers in the desert. That's what he's saying. He will do the impossible. If you have eyes to see it and a heart to receive it, that's my prayer for you, church, because decisions make up who we are. So I want to focus on what Paul said, because Paul said there's this one thing. Hey, man, wouldn't you like to sit down with Paul and say, what was your one thing? What were you thinking about? When you wrote that, what was that one thing? 
okay? But what's it, what one thing, let's think about this, what one thing, if you changed it, would make the biggest difference in your life? What one thing, if you change it, would enable you to get better? If, if that one thing went away or if that one thing happened, if you instilled that one thing that's not in your life, if you plugged it in your life, what one thing would make the biggest difference in my life? And if you think about that for just a moment, it's probably in one of these next few areas. The first one is in the area of my habits. Because we all, as we, as we live life, we just kind of collect destructive habits over time, you know? I mean, it, it, typically they start out as good things. It's like the Internet. The Internet's a good thing, but it can become a very destructive thing, Right? I, I, my wife and I were driving around j- just yesterday, and I said, honey, just instead of looking, she helps me drive by looking ahead. Any, anybody else's spouse help you drive? She helps me drive. She has an imaginary bro- brake pedal over on her side, too. doesn't work too well. Uh, but I said, look and see how many people, they're not texting. They're watching stuff on their phone while they drive. I mean, it, it's gone from texting to people are FaceTiming, people are watching videos while they drive. What's that going to lead to? Destruction. The Internet's this wonderful thing. I can find out stuff that used to take me so long to dig up, and I can find it just bam. It's a wonderful instrument, but it can become destructive. You're like, oh, Facebook helps me stay in touch with my family, and all of a sudden we're spending four hours a day on it. It becomes destructive. It's wonderful to live in the United States. We have plenty of food. It can become destructive. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've noticed, like me, every time you turn on the TV about the last week, they went from trying to sell you stuff and food and to selling you exercise equipment to get rid of what they sold you two weeks ago. Yeah. It's like a never-ending wheel, right? So what habit could you change or put in That's why we do 21 days of prayer and fasting, because I believe it takes 21 days to instill or install a new habit. So you have to say no to the old one and install a new one. Prayer and fasting isn't just saying no to stuff. It's saying yes to new things. My wife and I have already started. We're not eating past 7 o'clock. That's something that we can do our whole life. We're not picking any, we're not picking our phone up. We're not doing anything with technology before we get in God's Word in the morning. We've already installed that. Already. That's something we can do all year. Well, what created that? 21 days of prayer and fasting. We started saying no to our thoughts and, and started decluttering our life, getting rid of habits that just, we just pick up along the way. Secondly, how about your relationships? You're probably in some relationships that are not good. Maybe even some relationships where you are compromising. You might be, it might not have gone anywhere. You might be flirting with somebody at work. And it's like, you know what, just break, uh, change jobs if you have to. Just don't go there. It's not going to, it's not going to go well. It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to destruction. And it's some, some of your relationships, maybe your marriage is, you know, you're, you're married, you were, you know, just close, and over the time, you've just grown apart. Maybe the year, this is the year you just say, okay, we're putting this, we're restoring this. We're, we're purposefully going back together. We're going to restore what we lost. Maybe it's your time to get in a small group this year. And just go in a small group with that spouse that you feel and, and say, hey, before you read the Bible, we just want you to know that we're, we're feeling apart and we came in here because we want, you know, to get around other couples. And you know what they're going to say? Man, us too. And we'll, we'll, we'll go down that road with you. Amen, everybody? Relationships matter. And maybe this year you need to make some new relationships where you can encourage people eternally. Third, your debt, your finances. Maybe this is the year you need to stop adding to your debt 
and instead attack your debt. Instead of living like a slave, start living like a free person. We all make mistakes financially. The day that our daughter Christina was born, we got out of financial bondage that I had put us in. I, yeah, I made some drastic mistakes early on, listened to the wrong people. Just, you know, oh, yeah, it won't cost me anything. Sign the dotted line. Oh, boy. I made silly decisions. And I'll never, every year we celebrate Christina's birthday. <laughs> it's God's little reminder, remember how a slave you were? I don't want to ever go back. Maybe it's the year for you to be set free financially. Stop letting the world make your decisions because they're not paying the bill. You are. Can I get a better amen to that? And just enjoy a little freedom financially. How about your health? Maybe some of you need to not just go to the doctor, but how about this? Do what the doctor says. How's that for a new one? He'd been telling you the same thing the last several checkups. Hey, you need to do this, this, this. Yeah, I know, but you know, biscuit and gravy, I just like it too much. Okay? And it's, you know, you need to do what the doctor says. Or maybe some of you are, are like, you know, you're a he-man, and you, you haven't been to the doctor because you already know they're going to tell you bad things, and you're avoiding it. So go. Go to the doctor. Hit the gym. You say, man, I'm not going to the gym. Walk in the mall with your wife. That'll help you restore the marriage, too. Walk in the mall. Let all the young people sneer at you. Oh, look at those old mall walkers. <laughs> like the typical old mall walker, I said, we could take them, honey. We could take them. <laughs> they wouldn't last one time around. Do your health. Take care of your body. It's where Jesus lives. He says your body is the dwelling place of God. And how about your dreams? How about dreams that you had in the past? Maybe a business dream to start out on your own. Maybe, maybe your dream has been a mission trip. This is the year you should take action. Maybe God has placed in your mind an idea for ministry. Why don't you do it? What I'm saying is, why don't you make 2020 your best year ever? Well, how do I do that? Well, I can guarantee you this. 2020 will be the best year of your life if it is the best year of your life spiritually. Why? Because we are eternally spiritual beings. When God made you, he made a soul, and he put you in a body. This body's got a very small shelf life. You know, some 70 years, some 80, some 90, some even more than that. But 100 years compared to a million, that's a short shelf life. But your spirit, who you really are on the inside, it's going to live forever. In a place of wonderment, a place the Bible calls paradise, or a place of absolute horror and torment. Your soul's going to live forever. So that's why if 2020 is your best year spiritually, it will be your best year in this life because you're mainly a spiritual being. Can I get a good amen to that? So that's what this series is about. That one thing that you need, David and others wrote about that one thing. The psalmist, David, wrote it this way. He said, he made it clear, man, if I, if I just had one thing that I could choose, he said, this is what I would choose. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire. Now, David's had success. He was, a, he was the unparalleled military commander in the history of Israel. Before and after him, no one did what David did. Israel was the largest that it's ever been before or since under his rule. Clearly, he was good with women. Yeah? 
He wrote a lot of it down for us, and we're like, you know, the psalm, women love reading psalms. David wrote most of them. He's good with the lady folks. He was good as king. He had a couple, mis couple missteps, didn't he? Yeah, he did. But he said, in all of life, I've learned this. There's one thing I need, and here's what it is. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. You know what David said? I want to get with God. I want to get with God. He said, man, I want to get where God is. And let me tell you a little secret. The closer that we get to Jesus, the more he enables us to take care of that list that's in your heart. Let me say it again. The closer we get to Jesus, the more he empowers us to deal with that list of things that we know we need to do. The list can't, become, can't come before Jesus, you'll fail. But you put Jesus at the top, he'll help you with your list. David figured that out. He said, man, I got, I got to be with Jesus. This was played out with a couple of friends with Jesus in the New Testament in Luke, the 10th chapter, and it's in several of the gospel accounts. Jesus was, this was a, a place that he stayed uh, after he made their acquaintance and uh, while he was traveling with his disciples, it tells us in Luke, he entered a village. The village was actually Bethany, and a woman named Martha, I like this. Notice what she did. She welcomed him into her home. Now, some of you are sitting in here today, you won't even take that step. Welcome Jesus into the house. Jesus, come in here. I need you in here. I need you on the inside. Martha, welcome in, and the reason I'm paying attention to that because Martha's going to be the bad guy for the rest of the story. So I'm giving her some props right now because at least she had the mindset, man, we need to get Jesus in the house. And she had welcomed him into her home. Everybody said amen there. How about this? Say, good job, Martha. Okay, because she's going to biff it here in a minute. Well, she had a sister named Mary who also... Now, I want you to look at this. She sat at the Lord's feet. She wanted to get closer and was listening intently to what he said. But Martha, it wasn't Mary on one side, Martha on the other, but Martha was, say this word with me, distracted. Say it loud. Martha was distracted. Boy. Isn't that what life is good at doing with us? Distracting us. Probably a lot of you have experienced this. What did I come in this room for? <laughs> you say, oh, that's you getting older, Pastor. No, it's not. I've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> Those kids ruined me. <laughs> and why do you do that? Because on the way into that room that you were looking for that one thing, your mind picked up six others on the trip in. It wasn't just empty, 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 empty. Oh, there it is. It was, oh, here, oh, here, oh, here, oh, here. What did I come in here for? What is that? That's living distracted. Oh, we fall so naturally to that, don't we? Like I said, Internet's a wonderful thing. All of a sudden, we're spending, we, we can't look up from it. We can't even look up for it, from it to drive. That's living life distracted. It is. And it happens so easily. So Martha, who had the understanding and knowledge, said, man, life's going to be better if we get Jesus in the house. She was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to give me a hand. She's like, man, I'm, doing, I'm lifting all, I'm doing all the pots and pans, the, the cooking, and, and Mary just sitting there listening to him. Lord, tell her, would you please excuse her to tell her to come help me? I need her set of hands in the kitchen. And the Lord answered her, Martha, 
Martha. You are worried and upset about many things. He said, Martha, your focus is wrong. I want you to say these five things because it's kind of like the theme of the message. But one thing is necessary. You notice the theme here? One thing, one thing, one thing. You know why Jesus, I think, does this in Scripture? Because I think there's 20 things I need to do. I know there's 20 things I need to do. But Jesus said, you'll never do 20 till you start with one. You got to start with the one. So why did my list used to be five, and then went to 10, and grew to 15, and get to 20? Why? Because I've neglected doing the one. Oh, my house is a mess. I don't know what to do. Start with one room. So where'd you get that from? I watched it on house and garden TV. <laughs> Their house was so neat, I wanted them to invite me over so I could mess it up a little. Look like somebody lived in here. <laughs> Am I the only one who thinks those things? Like, man, nobody lives that neat. Lord, you don't care. Jesus said, you're, you're worried about the wrong things. You get the wrong focus. But there's one thing that's necessary. What, is, what did Jesus tell Martha was so necessary? And Mary has made the right choice to get close to Jesus. It'll never be taken away from her. It's, it's my privilege and my honor as a pastor to, to challenge you and to help you get closer to Jesus. Why? Because I know if you do, it's going to be the best year of your life. It'll be the best decade of your life. Because Jesus is all we need. He's all we need. So there's three things that I... We need to look at today to help you get closer to God. The first one, right from this story, the first one is, I have decided to make the most of this new year. In fact, I almost didn't say new year. I almost wrote in there opportunity, but it's the first Sunday of the year, so I said new year. Because really, it's an opportunity. The beginning of a year is, a, is an opportunity to change things, to take assessment and say, okay, I don't want this next year to be like that, you're so, these are the things I need that are distracting me, and these are the things that I need to plug in to keep me focused on Jesus. What have you decided? Now think about this. Martha has invited the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who spoke the world into existence with his words, and he came into her house. Jesus is in her house. And she's in the kitchen. Does that hit anybody beside me? What are you doing in the kitchen? Be where Jesus is. Right? Oh, they need to eat. He can make dinner. He could just say, Little Caesars, bam, man. They did not have door hub. I mean, they didn't have it. Grub hub, I'm sorry. <laughs> Never used it. I still go get my own. Okay, Jesus is in the house. Martha's in the kitchen. Can I say this? Jesus is in our house. Is your mind in the kitchen? He's right here in this room. Are you going to sit here for 40 minutes and miss him? Because he's here. You don't have to go some. He's right here. He's in the house with you. Will you do what Mary did and draw close to him? Ephesians, Paul writes this, Pay careful attention then to know how you walk, not as unwise people, 
but as wise. Making the most of the time. The word there, Greek word for time there is kairos. It's not only a measurement of time, but it's actually a Greek word that means window of opportunity. That kind of time. It's not always available. There's a window of opportunity. So let's read it like that. Don't live as unwise people, but wise, making the most of the opportunity that Jesus is in the house. Why? Because the days we live in are evil. That's why the Lord took Martha to task. He said, I'm in the house. Take advantage of it. And she was taking care, taking advantage of her pots and pans. Hmm. So let me challenge you. Let's take this year. If you're new here or if you've been here a while, it doesn't matter. Today's the first day of growth track. Start the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. Start with us today. If you're not on the reminders, you can get signed up in the lobby right today at the next step table or the welcome table. We'll sign you up and you'll get a daily prayer focus. And, and start praying. Start praying together as a church. Start reor- let, allowing God to reorganize your life. But today, as soon as church is over, go to Growth Track. Find out what we're about as a church. Get involved in a small group at the end of 21 days of prayer and fast. I mean, throw yourself into it. Join a dream team. Start serving. Make relationships with them. And if at the end of a year you throw in yourself into it, if you come to me and say, Pastor, I've given it a year, I went all in, and man, nothing's changed, I'll go to another church with you. So, I mean, if, if you give a church a year, and I mean, go all in, and, and it doesn't happen, then, man, we need to quit or do something that works. But why isn't it working? Because I think you got the toe in, but you haven't jumped all in. Make use of it all. Run the play. Run the play. We've set the play out. If everybody does this, this is what. Run the play. Stop running your own ta- play. You're on, a, you're on our team, right? Run the play. See if we can't get across the goal line. Can I get a good amen there? Amen. Run the play. Don't be in the kitchen. Jesus is in the house. Take advantage of him. I've decided to make the most of this year. Secondly, I've decided to get rid of every distraction. Every distraction. Was it wrong for Martha to be in the kitchen making food? No, it's a good thing she's got guests. Usually the things that distract us from the exact perfect will of God are not evil. They're good things, not the great things God has for us. They're good things. It wasn't an evil thing for her to cook. It was a good thing, but it was keeping her away from the great thing the lifetime opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus in your house. And a good thing was distracting her. A good thing was distracting her. When we decide to stop giving our lives for things that mean nothing, I mean going all in for things that mean nothing and exchange it for things that mean everything, you will be living a life without regret. Because a lot of what we do during the day, it means nothing in light of eternity. Nothing. Measure it with eternity in mind. Hebrews writes this. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, who are they? They're our loved ones. They're believers that have gone on before. Maybe you knew your grandparents and they were great believers, or maybe your great-grandparents, or maybe your mother and father, or maybe you're just thinking about the apostles. They have gone on before. And, and the writer gives a picture of a stadium, and they're in the stadium, and we're down here still running the race. They're saying, come on, man, you can do it. You can do it. And they're cheering us on. Isn't that encouraging? That's encouraging. They're like, come on, man. Some of you are like, They're watching me? Oh, I'm depressed now. Not that kind of watching. Okay. 
Because they're cheering us on, notice what he says. Get rid of their distractions. Lay aside every weight. Those are wrong things. And the sin, I'm sorry, those are good things. And the sin, those are the wrong things that easily traps us and snares us and instead run free. Run with perseverance, endurance, the race that lies before us. That's why we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. Not so you can start the year off going, oh, this is awful. Oh, it's so hard. Oh. No, that's not why. Okay? That's not why. We do 21 days of prayer and fasting so that you can do what? You can come alongside with others who are also getting rid of the distractions in their life and regain our focus on Jesus. Remember what the psalmist said, this one thing I need. Man, I need to be with Jesus. What did Mary need? She needed to be with Jesus. What was happening with Martha? Distractions. She was missing out on the most important thing. And that's what 21 days of prayer and fasting does. It, it, it helps us with the distractions. There's three ways to do this. Join in with the prayer. But three kinds of fast. First of all, there's the one that I'm doing. I'm doing a full or complete fast. In fact, as your pastor, I wanted to start ahead so that I could hear from God beforehand. And today is my eighth day of not eating food. And I'm going all 21 days. You're like, oh, well, if you take medicine, stuff like that, talk to the doctor, okay? And, and your life's going to change. But make sure your doctor gives you thumbs up approval on a complete fast because it's going to do, it's going to mess with your body, okay? It's going to mess with you. Another way to do it is a partial fast. And he's going with me and she's doing a partial fast. A partial fast means that you can, like, skip food a couple days a week or skip a meal a day or only eat, uh, you know, after you get home one meal a day or, 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 or subtract certain foods, you know, like no sugar for the 21 days, no breads for the 21 days, you know, and do that type of thing. But it also, the fasting is also not just from food but from things. Like how much are we going to Watch the internet this, this next 21 days. How much are we, are we going to change our TV habits? Are we going to change how much we look at that phone? Because they're distractions. Yes, some of it's necessary. It's amazing what we can get done with our phones. It's a personal computer. But it, a lot of it's just distracting us from what's important. I mean, I... Sydney and I will go places to eat, and we'll look at families, and they're all, all of them. And they do the whole meal. Nobody says anything. They might be, hey, can you bring me a re refill to the waitress? I don't know. Can you text the waitress? <laughs> or maybe they're testing, how did that fish taste, Dad? I, I don't know. But when we did the college group years ago, we started meeting with them one night a week at a restaurant, and the first rule we had to say is, put your phones away. And they're like, oh, yeah. I said, what are you doing with that phone? Well, I, just, I said, if your friend doesn't want to be here with you, they're not worthy of you texting them while you're here with your other friends. Be with who you're at. Be in the moment. Be in the moment. So maybe for a lot of you, it's just the 20 days of prayer and fasting is there. You're going to relearn how to be in the moment, man. Be in the moment. And then the last one is a Daniel fast. And what's a Daniel fast? It's basically cutting out meats, sweets, and, and grains. And you eat fruits and vegetables for 21 days. But jump in. Sometimes I already had people talking to me excited this morning. Man, I started this morning. I'm so looking forward to it. You're like, that's crazy. I was looking forward to it. My life felt cluttered. And in one week, I, it's like so much decluttering has taken place. I love it. Can't live all year doing this, but it's going to give me a springboard. Can I get it? Amen. Can I get it? And, and fasting just like super energizes your prayer. So decide to get rid of every distraction. Join us on the 21-day journey. Number three, I've decided to prioritize the presence of of Christ in my life. And that's the last blank, and everybody's like, okay, we're done. 
okay? But hold on, I got some important things to say, please. What I'm trying to do is to encourage you to experience this year, for lack of a better term, a a God-first life. What life looks like if you put God first in every circumstance, every happenstance, every scenario, every conversation, every action, every reaction, if you say, man, I want to put God first in this. I want to pray about this first. I want, what would your life do? I guarantee you it would be better. Because the world's way doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the world admits it doesn't work. Where do they admit it? Because every year when the calendar rolls around, the whole world says, you better make some resolutions. Why? Because they know it's not working. Can I get an amen to that? They know it's not working. So church, let's do what works. Prioritize the presence of Christ. You know, earlier in the message I said, I wonder what Paul's one thing is. He answers it for us right in the text. In Philippians, the third chapter, he, later on, he says, this one thing I do. He says in Philippians 3, 7, 8, I once thought these things were valuable. What? The stuff that distracts us. The stuff that gets us off track. The things that the world, the world says here. Paul said, I used to think they were valuable. This is a guy who used to murder Christians for his religious beliefs. You could not get more sold out than Paul was at attacking Christianity. Because why? He had a value system of the world. He said, the things that I thought were valuable, that he gave his life to, I now consider them worthless. Because of what Christ has done, my life. They're worthless. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What did he, what's his one thing? Knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus more. He said, for his sake, I have discarded everything else. That's the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Discarding everything else that's not important. Counting it all as garbage so that I could gain more of Jesus. He wants more of Christ. Do you want to phone? I, I don't want to sit here at the beginning of 2021, which is going to be here so quickly. And say, and look out here and, and look at the people. Let me tell you, one of the best decisions of my life, outside of just surrendering to Jesus, my all, was to marry Cindy and to devote ourselves to you. You one of the best decisions of my life. And as your pastor, it just, it frustrates me, but it grieves me. Yeah, it's a, it grieves me that there's so much more that God has for you. And you won't take advantage of it. And so we've created this for you. It's for you, so you can get more of him. Because that's what we need. You're never going to, you're never, well, I I overloaded on Jesus today. Never going to say that. (laughs) I overate on Jesus today. I think I'm going to puke some Jesus out today. Nope. You're not going to say that. The more you get, ready? the more your capacity grows to take in more. 
and you're never going to get to the end of them. Never. Paul said, I want more of him. That's what I want for you. I want for you. But there's probably some people in this room, and you've never taken that first step to know, to know Jesus. You know about him. You could tell somebody else what you know about him. But he's not in here. The Bible calls this word, this decision to be born again or being saved, calls it salvation. Let me tell you what it is. It's not joining the church. It's not even getting water baptized. It's, it's not praying a prayer. You become born again when you place Jesus as the priority relationship of your life. And when he is number one in your heart, you're saved. And how do you do that? With a choice. You decide. People are like, oh, man, I fell in love. Like you were not even looking and you fell into a ditch. No, you were looking. And you were trying to get around them and catch their eye. And why? Man, it started way before that conversation, right? There wasn't no falling about it. It was a choice, 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 choice. And then you finally screwed up the nerve to say, would you like get some coffee with me? And they say, when they say yes, you're like, woo, you didn't fall nothing. You were climbing a mountain. Can I get an amen? Well, let me tell you, same thing with Jesus. It's a choice of your very fiber of your soul. So I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, give you an opportunity to know Jesus right here. He's right in this room. He's right here. If you're in the kitchen, if your mind is elsewhere, you're going to miss him. Don't you see him? He's right here. Say, where is he? When I say see him, you know in your heart He's the one inside of you right now saying that's what that man is saying is true. You need to act on it right now. That's that thing, that voice inside your mind. That's Jesus inside of you saying, take advantage of this opportunity. It's not me. I'm not that persuasive. That's God on the inside of you. And only you can make this choice. For years, my parents tried to get me to make that choice. They couldn't make it for me. I had to make it. I had to make that choice. So with heads bowed, eyes closed right now. Now there's some people in here, one, two, ten, say, I'm going to surrender to the voice of God right now. Never done it before, but today I want to know Jesus. I want to pray with you and help you make that choice, but would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. Include me in that prayer. Yes, awesome, awesome. Anyone else? Awesome. Anyone else? Upstairs, you're including this too. Great job. Great choice, young men. Great job. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, yes, awesome. Awesome. Let's pray together. Father, we know you're here. You're moving in hearts. And Jesus, may all these men and women, young people, may they make a choice to place you God of their life, ruler of their life, authority of their life, the love of their life. And as they do so, may you give them a peace that passes understanding. As they ask for forgiveness, and ask you to come into their life. Thank you for being such an awesome God. And church, let's pray together. Father, Lord, as we enter this season where we want to make you our priority, to lose distractions, and to draw closer to you, Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in marriages, in single parents, and in, in young people, do a work in our 
with our habits, with our relationships, with our resources, or just do miracles in this congregation because you are God of the universe. And we want to draw close to you. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen. I have decided.